Thank you, Dr. Gray. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My first emotion, of course, is, of, is thanks to Dr. Gray and his amiable exaggerations. Uh, also, the fact that I am here, I should add that I'm somewhat intimidated by it. I'm always intimidated when I address so erudite a group of intellectuals. Um, it makes me a little more self-conscious uh, for having failed to graduate from high school. Uh, so, uh, failed only because of, of Euclid, uh, the fact that he had his angles and, uh, <laughs> and I had mine and, uh, and that they didn't coincide in the proper geometrical manner. That's one reason why I'm somewhat embarrassed. Uh, the other reason is that to talk about Robert Frost is still not, not easy for me. Uh, he was my oldest, longest, and dearest friend. And I don't want this to sound like an obituary. I hope it won't be. Uh, I will read some of his poetry, and I will talk somewhat about him, a little about my relations with him. Maybe it's easier for me to start to tell how I first discovered him, because I really did discover him. I had, among other things, I was the American correspondent for a, an English quarterly called Poetry and Drama. And uh, like most quarterlies, it, it appeared four times a year. Uh, it consisted only of English poets and some English essayists. And in, in December 1913, which is quite, quite a few years ago, I saw a new name, Robert Frost, which I hadn't seen before, and there were two poems by Robert Frost, and I assumed, of course, he was an English poet, because it was in the same issue that there were poems by W.W. W. Gibson and Rupert Brooke, Edward Thomas, and other English poets. Yet the poems had a curiously, not English, but a New English, or rather New England quality. Uh, the idiom, the turn of speech, and yet I thought, well, of course, uh, English writers have lived in America and have gotten some of their quality. After all, Rudyard Kipling did live in Vermont for some years. Nevertheless, uh, it bothered me. And I wrote to the editor, to Harold Monroe, and I received word that this was not uh, an English poet, but an American poet, who because of circumstances and low finances and the fact that he could not be published in America, was living in England and was about to publish his first book. I got a copy of his first book and wrote pleasantly about it. The first book was called A Boy's Will, a book of lyrics, uh, now full of quotable poetry, much quoted. And then came a book called North of Boston, which I reviewed most enthusiastically, and it was the first review that Frost had had in America. Then the First World War came, and, uh, and he came back to America uh, very rapidly, and he saw my review in a magazine. And the fact that it was a good review didn't exactly make him an enemy. Uh, we became friends, we became very good friends, maintained that friendship over a span of 50 years. Uh, I was there at his deathbed, and the resulting letters uh, from Frost to me, which were published a year or so ago, I think is the one thing that will ensure me some kind of uh, impermanent immortality in American letters. Uh, the, the letters he wrote to me are more important than anything I ever wrote. Anyway, the, all of Frost's life Everything he did was founded on a set of paradoxes, a set of contradictions, as it were. Uh, he was the most indigenous of, American, of New England poets, true New Englander, yet he was born in San Francisco. He was the most American of poets, and yet he was 
first recognized abroad. This is one of those extraordinary and rather embarrassing things. He had written in this country, yet his work was not like uh, in the in the early part of the 20th century, American poetry was very genteel. The impact of Whitman was felt, but most of the poets were still writing in a very genteel, very decorative, I, I, I'm almost say very ladylike manner, uh, using a, a vocabulary and a kind of rhetoric which was still fashionable, but not very real. Robert Frost was writing not that kind of work at all. He was writing a kind of characteristically plain utterance, which was use of common speech, of, of the colloquial idiom. And that didn't seem like poetry to the American editors. He'd had two little poems published when he was about 19, but now he was approaching 40. He was living in England, as I say, and these two volumes appeared, and it's something, I think, to the shame of American publishing that Frost's first two volumes, and maybe his most famous of all of his books, were published not in America, but in England. Another paradox was that the fact that although he never entered the competition, never entered any of those things for awards and honors, yet he received the Pulitzer Prize four times, uh, more than any other American poet, the only American poet to get that quadruple honor. And one other paradox, although his, his writings were mostly about the background of New England, regional, yet I don't think any poetry of our time was more universal. I don't, want, I don't want to give you a whole biography. Most of you have read enough of Frost to know that uh, he struggled through poverty and that uh, his father died when he was in his early 30s and the boy was taken from San Francisco back to New England and brought up there uh, by his mother, uh, who was a teacher. And it, he printed his first poem at 15 and it was published in the Lawrence High School Bulletin. It was a long ballad about the night when Cortez was driven out of Mexico City. So it shows you he, he began, as most of us begin, with highly romantic uh, poems of, of some other place than here. It took him some time to find his own background, even to find his own way of speaking. He grew up among his fellows. He graduated at 17 from high school. He delivered the valedictory, and his co-valedictorian was a remarkably pretty girl, Eleanor Miriam White, and three years later, he, he married her. He, he was very poor. He had a poor, a very crowded youth. As early as 12, he had tried to support himself and had picked up a few dollars as a helper on a farm. At 13, he worked in a shoe shop. At 16, he pushed wagons full of metal spools in a textile mill. At 18, he tended the dynamos and trimmed the carbon lamps over the spinning machines. I don't know any poet who had to struggle through so terrible a youth. He was not a farmer, I should add. Uh, this, this characteristic, or this characterizing of him as a farmer poet, he, he never began as a farmer. And he did farming very reluctantly. Uh, because long before he was 18, he knew what he wanted to do. He, he wanted to be a poet. He wanted to write poetry. Uh, his father had died. There was a grandfather with little property. And his grandfather said, uh, get yourself educated, boy. And he tried. He tried very hard. Uh, after being graduated from high school, he entered Dartmouth. And within two months, he was back home. Uh, there was no reflection on Dartmouth. And I don't think it was any reflection on Frost either. But his mother had a tough school to teach, uh, tough kids, and it was all she could do to keep order. And he gave up Dartmouth and went back and took over his mother's class. But then, again, there was a matter of supporting himself. For 10 years, between 18 and 28, he worked at various occupations in an effort to make a living again. He tried writing a newspaper column, he tried teaching school, tried managing a Shakespearean actor. He wrote stories and articles about hen-raising for 
poultry journals, not P-O-E-T-R-Y, but P-O-U-L-T-R-Y. Uh, very often confused. I, uh, uh, each time, I have, three times I've written in an essay or a book that he contributed to poultry journals, and each time the proof reader corrected me and made it poetry. Uh, they know that Frost couldn't do anything about poetry. Uh, anyway, uh, got married, tried, tried college again. He entered Harvard in his 22nd year and remained for almost two years. But again, the curriculum was not what he wanted, if he wanted the curriculum at all, which I doubt. Anyway, his grandfather gave his unambitious grandson a farm near Derry, New Hampshire. It was a refuge, really. And the refuge presented something of a challenge. For 25, Frost began farming, again rather reluctantly, partly because his grandfather said, go out and do something, earn your money, uh, raise chickens or uh, plant potatoes. And another reason was that he had gone to a doctor, he had a bad chest, and when the doctor learned that his father had died of tuberculosis, he said to Frost, go out get outside. And so, rather reluctantly, and for 10 years, Frost farmed. But it was unsuccessful farming. It was in New Hampshire, uh, where there was very little, he had some rocky acres, and he said he had to dynamite the rocks in order to plant potatoes, uh, which is certainly not the most uh, agreeable kind of humus. Uh, anyway, after years of unsuccessful farming, he decided to sail for England, uh, partly because he had heard living conditions were easier and chiefly they were cheaper. So he did, and he met uh, neighbors who were farmers and one or two who were poets. Uh, he met Rupert Brooke. He met Ezra Pound, uh, who befriended him for a while, but uh, when he saw that, when he, Pound, saw that he, Frost, could not be influenced by Pound. Uh, Pound rather dropped him, and Frost was relieved to be dropped. Frost was not a, not a good man to be influenced by. Uh, anyway, a year after he, he, lived, he was living in England, he went through what he had written, and uh, he felt he should try a publisher again. Uh, he had been rebuffed continually in America, and... He just chose a publisher, a publisher who had published W.E. Henley. Uh, Henley is another of the poets that he rather admired for his uh, masculine power. And he saw that the publisher was a man by the name of Nutt. Well, that didn't exactly discourage him, although not exactly a good name for a... But he found that Nutt, uh, Nutt had died, but there was a, a Mrs. Nutt who was just as... Uh, <laughs> I, I skipped the obvious pun. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he sent them to her without another word, and curiously enough, Mrs. Nutt looked at them uh, and said, all right, I'll publish them. It was as simple as that. No influential friends, no publicity, nothing, nothing to win favor except the poetry itself. And I keep on saying that young authors who are mad for publication and who cannot wait until they're volumes are, uh, are, are issued, should remember that Frost had to wait more than 20 years from the time that his first published poem appeared in that little high school magazine until, until this first publication. He was then almost 39 years old. It was called A Boy's Will. And this shows something of his uh, New England background because the title not only indicates the mood, A Boy's Will, but it pays a tribute to Longfellow, who in a poem called My, last, My Lost Youth, could be called My Last Youth too, uh, wrote, a boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. And that little a boy's will characterizes the, the book to a great extent. They are long, long thoughts, but they are a boy, a, a growing up thought. Uh, the English reviewers were very kind to it, but it was not until Frost published his second volume, still in England, north of Boston, that the rave reviews 
tremendous enthusiasm really spread and we even in America began to hear echoes and reverberations. And the chief thing about it was that they praised the author for his daring. We look at it today and there doesn't seem any daring, nothing daring and using uh, ordinary talk since our poetry today is almost founded on flat statement. But at this time it was very revolutionary to find that rich enjoyment in ordinary life and the poetic lifeblood in, in customary speech. Anyway, that quality which is, I think, so endearing in Frost, endearing and I think also enduring, uh, is the discovery that poetry can not only sing, as we expect of poetry, the lyric impulse, but that poetry can talk too. And the talk is about, in Frost, about common things, as common as a woodpile or as uncommon as a prehistoric pebble or as natural as a bird singing or as mechanistic as a modern factory. All of life was uh, Robert Frost's material and about people. Other people, other poets have written about people. And Frost's poetry is the people. The people are, are talking all the time. Either they're talking together or they're talking alone or Frost is talking not for them, but he, he is them. Let me illustrate now by a poem which I'm sure you all know, uh, which maybe is, I won't say a complete crux, a synthesis, at least the essence of Frost. It's one of his best known poems. And it came out of, it came out of something he told me later. It's called Mending Wall. And it's, as I say, one of his most quoted poems. It has two famous lines. And the two famous lines, he told me this uh, rather wryly, uh, W-R-Y-L-Y, uh, the two famous lines in the poem are not his own. One of the lines is, good fences make good neighbors. It's an old New England phrase which he picked up and made very much his own. And the other phrase, which is partly his, is something there is that doesn't love a wall. And some readers have seen many far-reaching implications in, in this poem, in these two lines, for it embodies, of course, one of the great problems of our time, where the national walls should be made stronger and stronger for protection, for isolation, or whether, since, the, uh, since walls are barriers in the way of eventual brotherhood, whether walls should not be let down or even torn down. And that question is the heart of the poem. Uh, it really answers itself in the paradox of people and the very inconsistent nature of men. But let me tell you, well, let me read the poem which tells it better than anything else. It's of course about New England uh, where the winters are very severe and the spring comes suddenly, erratically, and there's great heaving and thawing and the walls that you put up come down because uh, the heaving and thawing spills them and it's an old New England custom for the neighbors to repair the wall. One walks on his side of the wall and whatever rocks and boulders are his he puts together and the other. So it becomes a kind of communal thing where they have something in common and yet their ideas are not at all in common. And this is a poem. I read, most of you know it, but I'm sure it, like a good piece of music you can hear it again. Mending wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but, but at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on the day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with 
handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. Comes to little more. There where it is, we, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good, na- good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But, but here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd like to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I would like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone, savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees, He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes it, having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. There are two qualities in that poem to which I want to call attention. One is the fact that he plays plays even. I always had a suspicion that Frost was the one that wanted the wall down. Uh, When he says he wants it down, and then he says he moves in darkness, as it seems to me, a kind of darkness of, of prejudice or of training or of intolerance, whatever you will. But Frost says, no, there are two kinds of people. And he said, I'm afraid I'm both of them. Uh, the other thing is his humor. Here is a very serious poem, serious in every way. Uh, and yet that glint of playfulness, of raillery, a kind of banter, is all the way through. Uh, here... This little whimsicality, uh, saying to the, saying, as they're putting the wall uh, wall together, putting the boulders back, stay where you are until our backs are turned. Just another kind of game. And he says, uh, uh, we don't need the wall. He's all pine, I'm apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. Uh, All of that is kind of, a kind of fooling. uh, And uh, I could say elves to him. All of this, all the way through, there is this banter, this kind of raillery. And this is true of practically everything, practically every poem that Frost has ever written. Even the most serious, even the most painful, there is a kind of, kind of playfulness, a kind of verbal playfulness and a mental playfulness. In fact, I don't think any poetry ever written in America has had this extraordinary combination of profundity and playfulness. Uh, it's, 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 it's continual. Uh, even, in, even in some of the most... Well, I, I'm going to read one poem, a rather long poem, in which the playfulness, is, again, is only faintly indicated. And it's probably, I think, one of the most beautiful poems written in the last hundred years. It's, it's the death of the hired man. And again, it's a perfect fusion of casual talk and deeply moving undertones. Under this vocabulary, this colloquial speech, there's a, a deeply emotional one. It's a poem, extraordinary poem, which only three people are portrayed. A farmer, his wife, and an old worn-out laborer, a hired hand. Uh, and it's the hired man who never appears, and yet he is the one who is most fully revealed. The whole poem is about uh, this hired man. It's a poem which is heard, or as I think, overheard in whispers. Mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table, waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard. Silas is back. She pushed him outward with her through the door and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. Be kind. She took the market things from Warren's arms and sat them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. Warren says, 
When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last hang, didn't I? If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else would harbor him at his age for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay, he says, enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say, all right. I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself if that was what it was. You can be certain when he begins like that, there's someone at him trying to coax him off with pocket money. In haying time, when, when any help is, is scarce, in winter then, he comes back to us. I'm done. Shh, Mary said, not so loud. He'll hear you. Hear me? I want him to. He'll have to sooner or late. Warren, he's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Howe's, I found him there, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. A miserable sight, and frightening, too. You needn't smile. I didn't recognize him. I wasn't looking for him. And he's changed. Wait till you see. Where did you say he's been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house and gave him tea and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He, he just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything. Mary, Mary, confess. Confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren. But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge that poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture too. That sounds like something you have heard before. Well, Warren, I, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. He made me feel so queer. To see if he was talking in his sleep, he ran on Harold Wilson. You remember the boy you had in Hang four years since? He'd finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they two will make a team for work. Between them they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he mixed up everything with other things. He thinks young Wilson is a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they fought all through July under the blazing sun, Silas up on the cart to build the load, Harold along beside to pitch it on? He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas, so concerned for other folk, and nothing to look backward to with pride, and nothing to look forward to with hope. So now, and... Never any different. That's Silas. Part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw it and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the harp-like morning glory strings, taut with the dew from garden bed to eaves, as if she played unheard. Some tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home. He has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home, he said mockingly. She said, yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he's nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods worn out upon the trail. Home, said Warren. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Mary says, I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back, broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silence says better 
claim on us, you think, than on his brother? Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why doesn't he go there? His brother's rich, uh, a somebody, a uh, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. Mary says, I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to it if there is need. He ought to write, be taken in, uh, and might be willing to. He, he might be better than appearances, but have some pity on Silas. You think if he had any pride in claiming kin or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep close still about him all the time? And Warren says, I wonder what's between them. Mary says, I can tell you. Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but he's just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anybody. Worthless though he is, he won't be made ashamed to please his brother. And Silas and Warren says, Well, I can't think Si ever hurt anyone. Mary says, No, no. But he hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his old head on that sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'll be surprised at him, how much he's broken. His working days are done, I'm, I'm sure of it. I'd not be in such a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go, look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, and then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were three of them, making a dim row. The moon, the little silver cloud, and she. Warren returned. Too soon, it seemed to her, slipped to her side and caught up her hand and waited. Warren, she questioned. Dead was all he answered. Of course, I think that's a great poem, and that the poetry seeps through it the poetry in understatement and understanding and that beautiful bit about the moon and the weaving these strings and of course those two great definitions of home the bitter one that home is the place where when you have to go there they have to take you in and her reply the very sweet one home is the place you haven't to deserve this illumination all the way through of plain talk and subterranean tragedy. I'm going to read two more poems. These are much shorter. And I think it'll interest you to see the origin of the poems. This is something I don't believe in doing as a rule. I don't believe that poetry should be taken too much apart and that the how a poem comes, originates, is not a particularly important but since I was implicated in these two poems, I am going to read them with a background. Uh, Frost had come back from England. He was living up in Vermont. I had left New York City where I had been born and badly bred and, and miseducated. Uh, I had left that rat race, even though some of the rats were my best friends. Uh, <laughs> And I decided to become a, a gentleman farmer. I moved up into the Adirondack Mountains uh, to be a gentleman farmer. Uh, I failed in both capacities, but that, uh, <laughs> that's extraneous. Uh, the point is I did want to become a farmer, and I bought a place opposite Robert Frost's place on the other side of, on, on the other side of Lake Champlain. Uh, I moved up into the Adirondack Mountains and began to try to farm. Uh, my place was almost as unproductive as Frost, but again, uh, I loved it because it was beautiful. I had to find out that man does not live by scenery alone, but uh, I tried. I, tr I tried. Anyway, I would go over to Frost continually. We'd become very, very good friends by that time, and I learned farming, and I learned a great deal more, of course. I learned about other things. 
much more than I did about farming. But on this particular day, uh, I'd gone over to him. It was in late August. And up in New England, we have only, only two seasons, winter and August. And August is a, and August is a very short month, so we have a, a great deal of winter. Uh, and the frosts begin uh, in, in late August, and we can't plant uh, until sometime in May, so three months is not a very good growing season. Uh, you can fill your silo, that is if you buy the stuff from the Grange or other people. The uh, <laughs> result is that farming becomes a very expensive thing up there, but uh, uh, anyway, we walked around his farm, and there was a little, what I thought, pony, since I was a cold, of course, uh, uh, running around, and a few flakes of snow were beginning to fall. As I said, it was late August, uh, the premonition of winter. And I said, what a lovely scene, a real courier and I have seen uh, the little snow beginning, the lovely pasture, this little horse kicking up its heels, uh, sheer delight, having the time of his life. And Frost rather grimly looked at me and said, you're, you're going to be an awfully bad farmer. And I said, undoubtedly, but why the rude remark? He said, well, you just don't know anything. You don't know anything about animals. That horse is not having the time of his life. First place, he's not a horse. He's a young Morgan. Uh, uh, Morgans were originally bred in Vermont, and the Morgan is half work horse and half riding horse and so forth. Uh, and I said, well, suppose I don't. He said, you don't know about horses. You don't know that this horse is frightened. He's not playful. I said, what's he frightened about? He said, snow. He's never seen snow. He's never felt it. These white things come down like white flies. They sting him. He's trying to get rid of them. And he's running. He's running away. So I said, really? And I said, why? He said, well, uh, he said, I've just told you he, he isn't winter broken. So I said, what a lovely phrase. I, I've heard of house broken, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> winter broken is, is a new one. And he said, well, that's, that's what he is. He's not winter broken yet. And that was all. And a few weeks later, I got this poem, which again is uh, this mingling of seriousness, of banter, playfulness, and great charm. And I think, again, great, simple poetry. It's a poem which since has been in practically every anthology, not only for grown-ups, not only for uh, students, not only anthologies for uh, classroom, but in children's anthologies. And that's one of Frost's charm. 50% of Frost can be read by any intelligent child, that, granting that some children are intelligent. Uh, it's called The Runaway. And by the way, the poems I read before were both from north of Boston, and as you must have observed, in a rather loose blank verse, no rhyme. The, in the subsequent books, Frost went back to his first book. He loved rhyme. He loved all the music that rhyme could make. And at least 50, oh, I should say 80% of his later work is in rhyme. Beautifully done. Uh, not enough attention has been paid even now to Frost the craftsman. He's an extraordinary craftsman. This book is, this poem is written in very simple mostly couplets and rhymed throughout. The Runaway. Once, once when the snow of the year was beginning to fall, we stopped by a mountain pasture to say, who's cold? A little Morgan had one forefoot on the wall, the other curled at his breast. He dipped his head and snorted to us, and then he had to bolt. We heard the miniature thunder where he fled, and we saw him, or, or thought we saw him, dim and gray, like a shadow against the curtain of falling flakes. I think the little fellow's afraid of the snow. He isn't winter broken. It isn't play with the little fellow at all. He's running away. I doubt if even his mother could tell him, sakes, it's only weather. He'd think she didn't know. Where is his mother? He can't be out alone. And now he comes again with a clatter of stone and mounts the wall again with whited eyes. 
and all his tail that isn't hair up straight. He shudders his coat as if to throw off flies. Whoever it is that leaves him out so late when other creatures have gone to stall and bin ought to be told to come and, and take him in. Well, there it is. Perfectly charming poem. Sweet, simple. And yet again, the playfulness. Uh, he's often been compared to Wordsworth as a nature poet. And he is not, of course, any more than Wordsworth was. But there is a pastoral background. And yet I don't think that even Wordsworth could have had that New England tang and said, I doubt if even his mother could tell him, sakes, it's only weather. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to read one other very, very short poem. One of the shortest poems he ever wrote. Also the result of something in which I was implicated. Uh, Frost was a great, great talker. I am not altogether a strong, silent type either. <laughs> but I, at the end of a day, which is usually midnight, I'm willing to go to bed. At midnight, Frost is just beginning to wake up. Uh, and then he goes, talking brilliantly. And when you begin yawning about 1.30, he is, I say is, it's terrible. He would be very offended. Uh, he said, what's the matter? You want to go to bed so early? And, uh, and this was one of those long conversations, an after-midnight conversation, on that cheerful topic, the end of the world. And uh, one of us, I forget which, said that the world will end in some monster holocaust, some terrible cataclysm uh, bursting up or uh, within it, or we will be sucked back into the sun, uh, according to the science fiction boys, and we will end in one short blaze and that will be all. Uh, the other, I forget again which, said it on the contrary. It will be just the opposite. Uh, the sun will get older and older, we will get colder and colder, and we will go through the, the galaxy, through the universe, eternally and eternally, a small, shriveled uh, snowball. Uh, whatever the result was, I didn't know. But again, a few weeks later, I got this poem, which is a classic double epigram, as it were. Again, with this kind of laconic way of disposing in simple speech. It's called Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. I'm going to read that again, partly because Frost would always do that. He, uh, and any of his short poems, he would say to the audience, would you like me to say that again? Never said recite it or read it. He always said, say it. I'm going to say this again. Partly because, again, the idea of taking fire and ice and contrasting it with deep emotion, warmth, love, and ice, which would be hate, apathy, these were the two things which wore in all of us. And yet even in there, there's a little glint of humor, not just in the comparison, in the kind of vague metaphor, but, but if it had to perish twice, in other words, very, very few things die twice, even the universe, I mean, one death is enough, but that rather, if it had to perish, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. I could go on talking endlessly about Frost. I have written endlessly. I've written at least two books and I don't know how many articles. But I want to end with something that Frost didn't say, that was said about Frost. In the place of poetry, let's say, this is neither, this is me speaking now. The place of poetry in the modern world has been argued and argued innumerable times by countless self-involved creators, craftsmen, critics, and so forth. But I don't think it's ever been stated as simply or more eloquently than in the remarks made by John F. Kennedy. The remarks were made upon 
Kennedy receiving an honorary degree at Amherst on October 26, 1963. And it happened to be that particular day that there was the groundbreaking for the Robert Frost Library at Amherst College. In a tribute by one great man to another, this is what the martyred president said. Our national strength matters. It matters a great deal. But the spirit which informs and controls our strength matters even more. This was the special significance of Robert Frost. He saw poetry as the means of saving power from itself. When power leads men toward arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and the diversity of his, ex of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. For art establishes the basic human truth which must serve as the touchstone of our judgments. The highest duty of the writer, the composer, the, the artist, the creator, is to remain true to himself, say what he has to say, and let the chips fall where they may. Robert Frost never heard that tribute, but he would have been the first to applaud the sentiment. He was its instigator, really, as well as its chief exemplar, because although he never changed from what he knew was true, he made us aware of the things that we always knew, but most of it had forgotten. Thank you. Thank you for your kind and very uncritical approval. Uh, I can only say thank you again unless you'd like me to do the whole thing over again. <laughs> <laughs>